Attack on Titan Final Season Episode 18 is out. And with this new episode, we get to see whether or not Mikasa, Armin, John, and Connie truly decide to help their lifelong friend, as well as the continuation of Eren's fight for survival against Porco, Reiner, and Peak. And trust me, this fight gets intense in all of the best ways. I'm talking plot twists, emotions, and bad assery. But before I begin, don't forget to Colossal Titan nuke that like button and slide into that subscribe button's DMs to hit that notification bell. And so, without further ado, let's jump right into Attack on Titan Final Season Part 2, Episode 2, titled Sneak Attack. This episode opens up exactly where the last episode left off, with the remaining sane members of the 104th Cadet Corps, Connie, Mikasa, Armin, and John, discussing whether or not they should help the struggling Eren fight back against the Marlene invaders and Titans, or leave him to suffer the fate he brought upon himself. Armin, who seems to still be 100% Team Eren, tries to convince group that Eren never planned on going through with the Eldian euthanasia plan in the first place, saying that he believes Eren is actually using Yelena and Zeke to gain the Founding Titan's power for his own purposes. And when he does gain it, he's going to use it to cause the rumbling, which will keep Paradis safe for at least another 50 years. In hearing Armin's pleas to help Eren, Connie and John admit that it does seem very unlike Eren to betray his friends and his people. So they reluctantly agree to help their friend. With the team in agreement, Anya Kapon leads our beloved heroes up the stairs and out of their cells to gear up and aid their comrade. While running up the stairs, Mikasa, who notably has been the most hesitant about helping Eren and is still clutching her iconic scarf, questions Armin's allegiance. Asking if what he suggests is true and Eren is hiding his true intentions, then why did he, one, push the both of them away and two, specifically specifically tell Mikasa that he hates her. In hearing these questions, Armin remembers what Eren said the very first time they all made it to the ocean. If we kill all our enemies over there, will we finally be free? And his expression notably changes before he mutters to himself, could it be? However, before he can continue explaining his thought process, he suspiciously and quickly changes the subject, explaining to Mikasa that he and Eren have no about her headaches for a while now, so his claims about them being because of her Ackerman instincts was likely a lie he used to make everything else he said after it more believable. And Armin ends the conversation by telling Mikasa that they can just ask Eren why he did what he did when this is all over. Now, let me just say, if you weren't suspicious of Armin before, then you have gotta be suspicious of the dude now. Not only did he avoid Mikasa's question, but he willingly withheld information from her. And judging by his sudden change in expression from a shocked to gloomy one after remembering what Eren said at the beach, it obviously is something very important to Mikasa. And could it be that Eren wants to eliminate all non-parody nations, whether they hate parody or not, and Mikasa being not only of foreign descent, but of royal foreign descent, makes her a target? Or am I looking into this entirely wrong? I guess we'll have to find out in the coming episodes. But anyway, following this, the story cuts back on over to Reiner and Eren, where we see that after Reiner pierced Eren with one of his own Warhammer spikes, Eren, in retaliation, blasted Reiner backward with another barrage of his spikes. Reiner, believing Eren to be defeated and outmatched, can't understand why Eren refuses to give up, asking, why struggle? What are you fighting for? We then get this gorgeous moment where Eren, struggling to move, continues to fight off Porco and Reiner, as the soundtrack changes to a beautiful, solemn melody with all of the titans being battered and broken, fighting for what they believe is right. It's honestly a short but amazing scene, and I gotta give props to the audio team for their work here. It truly embodies the desperation of this moment. But after Eren manages to get a heavy hit on Porco, he is quickly pinned down by Reiner, leaving his nape open for the taking. Reiner, readying himself to devour Eren, proclaims that he just wants this war to end, and he tells Eren to stop resisting and just go to sleep. 
However, it's at this moment where seemingly out of nowhere, Eren gains the strength to fight back. And with a glint in his eye and a scream that somehow manages to shake the entire city, he pushes his hand into Reiner's face and slowly begins to rip his skull from his jaws. Now, this scene is one, badass as all hell, and two, really interesting. Because not only did Eren seemingly regain his strength from nowhere, but it was accompanied by a monstrous roar. Could this be a secret power of Eren's or of the Founding Titan that in a life or death situation, Eren has managed to activate all on his own? Well, we don't know just yet. As before we can figure it out, and before Eren can fully rip Reiner's Titan face off, a giant ball of debris flies directly into Reiner, knocking him clean off Eren and into a nearby building. And it's here where it's revealed that the ball of debris actually came from none other than Zeke Jaeger who is now atop the wall in his beast form. And in a pure, unadulterated, adrenaline-filled moment, Zeke announces that although he may be late, he made it to his and Eren's planned rendezvous point, and that Eren's not to worry any longer, because his big brother is here. I would be lying if I didn't say I got chills when this happened. And rightly so, as immediately after making this grand entrance, Zeke takes down all of the airships with flying debris, prevents Peak from General Maggot from shooting their cannon again by forcing them to move into combat with Flock and some Jaegerists, and he provides a barrage of cover fire for Eren, single-handedly holding back Reiner and Porco with his debris attack. At a distance, this dude is OP as fuck. With Zeke now in sight and being free to move, Eren slowly begins to limp his damaged body in Zeke's direction. But before we see any more, the story shifts, this time to Colt and Gabby, who decide to leave the Titan fighting to, well, the Titans, and instead go on the lookout for fellow Marleyan child, Falco. Now with this, the story cuts over to Falco, who is still in captivity with the other parody soldiers who have ingested Zeke's spinal fluid. We see that Falco is talking with Commander Niall Pock, who tells the young Marleyan child how there is so much he wanted to tell his wife and daughter. But now with one scream from Zeke, he will turn into a Titan and be gone forever. Although it's not all all doom and gloom, as he does try to raise Falco's hopes by saying that this Marley invasion might be Falco's one chance to get home and see his family again. Jean, Mikasa, Connie, and Armin then arrive on the scene after confronting their Jaegerist captives about helping Eren, and they free all of the locked up Paradi prisoners, spinal fluid drinkers and non spinal fluid drinkers alike. Once all the captives are freed, Commander Pixis rounds up the troops and orders all the non spinal fluid drinkers to gear up in ODM gear while the others prepare to man the front lines. Mikasa, while suiting up in her ODM gear in an, I suppose you can call it, character-defining moment, willingly chooses to take off and leave her red scarf behind, which I believe is the first time in the entire series she has ever worn ODM gear without it. And I have no doubt this is a moment which will be talked about and discussed in every single character study essay on Mikasa from this point forward. Who knew putting down a scarf could be such an important and symbolic sequence? But with our main human cast fully suited up and ready for action, our four heroes head outside to the battlefield, where they are greeted with the image of burning and exploding warships plummeting from the sky with the Beast Titan atop the wall, obliterating Reiner and Porco with a barrage of debris as their childhood and beloved friend stumbles his way towards his older brother. Gotta say, it was probably a sight to see. The group, shocked to see Zeke out and moving on his own, note how there is no way Levi would let him go free. So Yelena, who is also there, suggests that he must have been defeated by Zeke, which only shocks our heroes even more. Armin, getting everyone back on track, declares that now is not the time to hesitate, and they must help Eren and Zeke save the world, which for some reason causes Yelena to pull this face, activating everyone's, and even my own, fight or flight response. But she swiftly changes her attitude, asking them to do their best. As the group flies off into the battle, we cut back to Colt and Gabby on the hunt for Falco, who are hiding behind a street corner after noticing a group of enemy soldiers coming out of a building. Here, Gabby asks Colt what the big metal pipe he is carrying around is, to which he responds, it's an anti-Titan rifle that is capable of killing a Titan if fired directly into their nape. 
And let me just say, this rifle is undoubtedly a Chekhov's gun, and it will be interesting to see who they use it on later. But it's also at this moment that Colt realizes amongst a group of parody soldiers they are hiding from is his brother Falco, who also notices Colt and Gabby hiding. Falco tells his newfound friend, Niall Pock, that he just saw his brother. So, Pock secretly brings Falco over to the hiding Colt and Gabby and tells the trio to go home. The Marleyan trio, now reunited, proceed to make their way back to their troops. And in the process of doing so, Colt questions Gabby, asking her why she stopped him from attacking Pock, their enemy, when he was making his way towards them with Falco. But before she can respond, the trio are forced to hide in a nearby house. As it just so happens, Niccolo and the Browse family are starting to make their way in their direction. While hiding, Gabby overhears the Browse family mention her and Falco, as they pray for the duo's safety and well-being. In hearing these comments, an emotional Gabby goes to reveal herself to the family. But before she does, she also hears Kea, the girl Sasha saved, wishing for Gabby's murder. Once the coast is clear, Colt tries to keep moving, but as he goes to move, Gabby, now overwhelmed with emotions, comes to the harsh realization that the so-called Devils of Paradis, she and everyone else despised, hated and wished nothing but pain and suffering for, were never devils to begin with. They were, and are, just human like everyone else. And in this realization, Gabby apologizes to Falco for dragging him into all of this mess. In response to this, Falco tells Gabby that it's not her fault, and that he he unintentionally helped in the Liberio massacre by sending Eren's letters out to his friends. Falco then, taking Niall Pock's words to heart about regretting not telling his family everything he wanted to before ingesting Zeke's spinal fluid, confesses his love for Gabby, admitting that he only became a candidate so she wouldn't throw away her life as a titan and could live a long and happy life. And finally, he admits to Colt and Gabby that if Zeke screams, he will more than likely turn into a titan. Gabby, refusing to accept that Falco may become a titan and ultimately die, rips off the black band around his arm and together with Colt, they proclaim that they need to go and tell Zeke the situation, as in hearing Falco will be affected, there is a good chance he won't scream. Which I say, I don't know about that one. The dude was going to euthanize his entire race. I'm not sure the life of a child would affect is conscious much. But anyway, with this declaration, the story cuts back to Zeke still firing away at Reiner and Porco. As he is doing this, at the corner of his eye, Zeke spots the steaming remains of Peak's Titan form, and he assumes the beloved cart Titan has met her ultimate end. The Jaegerists, who were locked in combat with Peak, begin to celebrate their victory over the Titan. However, they quickly realize that none of them landed the final blow, and it's revealed that this was all just a plan. Ploy, as the soldiers atop Peak, now hidden in the smokiness of steam, open fire on the distracted Jaegerists. As General Maggot, still in the cannon, lands a sneak attack on Zeke, obliterating a good portion of his neck and most of his real body. Zeke, now on the verge of death, falls off the wall and onto the ground below. And with this, episode 18 comes to an end, as a still limping Eren rushes to fulfill his destiny and make contact with his nearly dead brother, as Reiner and his fellow Marleyan troops gain one last opportunity to not only prevent the Founding Titan's power from being used, but to prevent Zeke from screaming, turning hundreds of parody soldiers into Titans. Overall, this was an absolutely fantastic episode. From Eren's resolve, to Zeke's arrival, to Mikasa's choice, to Armin's suspiciousness, to Falco's confession, to Gabi's realization, scene after scene hit with just the right ooh factor that I was not only engrossed in the moment, but at the same time dying to know what happens next. Every character's choice and action had me hyped up, but at the same time questioning whether or not I know the true intention behind it. I cannot wait to see where the story goes from here, and to see what's in store for our massive, beloved cast of characters. But let me know what you thought of this episode. Comment your thoughts and opinions below, but remember to keep them spoiler free. If you like this video, don't forget to leave a like. For more content like this, subscribe to the Lunchtime Crew. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Plus Ultra.